I'm sure you've noticed this. You're on a conference call with someone who's halfway around the world, and you say something, and then you have to pause a moment before they respond. That's latency. That's a delay. With speech, it's not really a problem. We talk over each other all the time in real life. But with music, that's a problem. With COVID, there were performances by musicians who were each in different locations around the world. And what we saw on screen was about four to six boxes of musicians all seemingly playing together. But what we didn't know was that it really wasn't live. Someone had to go in and put those performances together and sync all the instruments. What if you could remove the latency with music online altogether? In a moment, we'll meet with someone who's successfully done that, allowed musicians around the world to perform live together, and what it might mean for future communications. Welcome to The Hacker Mind, an original podcast from For All Secure. It's about challenging our expectations about the people who hack for a living. I'm Robert Famosi, and in this episode, I'm exploring latency in communications. How, given the way the internet was designed, there seems to be no way around that. Except my guest and his colleagues, well, they've come up with something that works. I hope you'll stick around. Ordinarily on the Hacker Mind, I use a licensed music service. This, however, is a live recording, and it's different. The difference you might not be able to discern from listening is that each musician is geographically separated from each other, yet playing live. For example, the ukulele and the voice are from Hawaii. The keyboard is in another part of Hawaii. The bass is coming from Brooklyn, New York. And the melodica? Well, it's in San Francisco. In a world where most of us are used to teleconferencing systems such as Zoom, we might be tempted to say, yeah, so what? But to a musician, the timing and latency are really critical issues, if not disastrous when they go wrong. The problem really came to fore with the worldwide pandemic, when people were not in general traveling, let alone being in the same room with one another. People had been working on this problem before COVID, of course, and the solutions were offered, but there wasn't a great solution out there. Part of it is the way the internet was first constructed. Latency is sort of hmm, baked in as a problem. So I turned to an expert in digital music and technology. I'm Mark Goldstein. I've been a freelance musician for a long time, and I'm a, a computer science graduate, now retired, and I've uh, spent most of my career bouncing back and forth between technology and, and art, and art and technology. And I used to think I was going around in circles, but after moving to California and being introduced to the wider world of electronic music and computer music and, and recording technology, I see I've been working perhaps in ever-ascending spirals oscillating between those two poles. And I've been very lucky to work in both of those areas. As we'll hear, Mark's experience with digital music is extensive. So when the worldwide pandemic first hit in 2020, he saw a lot of musicians experimenting with conferencing systems and didn't really like the results. Early experiments were done with uh, conferencing systems like Zoom and Google Meet, and very quickly musicians and teachers learned that there was this problem of a time lag between me playing and hearing the response from partners, one or two or many, on, on the call. Uh, and this did not provide a very satisfying musical experience, no matter what the context was, whether it was an actual attempt to have a performance or a rehearsal or even something as protean as, as a lesson. So a few years ago, some very, very interesting uh, software solutions to this began to appear. One of the first ones was Jamkazam, a commercial product, followed pretty quickly by an open source project called Jamulus. They had slightly different approaches to the problem, uh, but they did give reasonable performance over a limited distance between the players uh, because of the technology that was employed. 
Uh, and both of those programs have been getting better and better as, as, as time goes on. Uh, a, a third player in that space uh, came from Stanford University called Jack Trip, which was originally a, uh, an experimental project to connect musicians all over the world. And they realized pretty much during the pandemic that this technology would also be applicable you know, for regular musicians who just want to have fun and play. Uh, because one of my mantras is, to play is the thing. It's all about to play, uh, no matter what the context of the particular musical application is. Um, what Jack Tripp brought to the table uh, was, well, it wasn't actually Jack Tripp, but the Jack Tripp org brought to the table was people were having problems installing basically experimental software and tweaking it and calibrating it. So they decided they would put out... Uh, a, a Raspberry Pi based little appliance that users could just plug into their computer uh, and maybe jump over some of the hurdles to making these projects, these applications work. Oh, so that should work. I mean, you get an appliance and you hook it up and we should be good, right? The downside of that is, you know, there's people that don't know how to put a stereo together either. <laughs> and so for some of the folks that didn't know how to configure a computer, buying this appliance can help. And for others, uh, they're just as uh, confused when they're told to uh, connect the Ethernet cable to, uh, to your modem. And w what's that? Um, so there, there, are, there are technical stumbling blocks to all of these solutions. Right. These are musicians not technicians. So what I came up with with, with Telejam with a couple of other friends that, that helped Bar Smoos and Michael McNabb, we've been working together on this for a few years, was the idea that, um, first of all, the biggest thing was I wanted to solve this problem that no matter how you designed these systems up till Telejam, at some point when the distance between players is so great that the travel time of the sound, no matter how you're shipping the sound over the internet goes from player A to B, the latency, the time lag, just gets too long to play, play music together. So there's that lag problem again. If I'm on the west coast of the United States and Mark is in Europe, there's going to be a lag between us. When talking, again, that might be okay. But if I'm trying to play a musical piece along to Mark's beat, well, that becomes a challenge. And it often doesn't sound that great. I like to say synchronicity and, simultaneous, and simultaneity are not the same thing. You can play together, but it won't be synchronized if you're very, very far apart. It's just, you know, sound over the Internet travels slow, and it's not the speed of light. Theoretically, it should be, but it just isn't because of the way the Internet buffers and routes and sometimes disrupts connections. So perhaps we need to introduce the concept of hops as well. The Internet is distributed. It's designed to withstand a nuclear attack, so signals have to be broadcast in all different directions, and only the individual packets contain the information on where its final destination will be. The way a signal gets from Mark to me is not direct, but through a series of way stations that relay the signal and keep relaying the signal until it reaches one or the other of us. Sometimes the number of hops to get from point A to point B are few. So the latency is small. And sometimes the number of hops is so great that you really start to notice that latency. That's the way the Internet was designed. But even if we had a direct wire, there's still some natural delay. And even if we had a single beam of light, the speed of light is such that there would still be a natural delay. For example, there's a natural two and a half second delay for a single photon of light to travel from the moon for example, there's a natural two and a half second delay for a single photon of light to travel to the moon and back. Well, Mark was looking for a way to get around all that. So I was trying to come up with a model that would ship sound around the world, enabling musicians to play together in some form without regard to the distance. And that's where the architecture of a daisy chain came up. And that's the really, really important thing that, that we've done that separates us from all of the other applications. Uh, having said that, there is a trade-off, and I'll get into that later. But the idea of using a daisy chain to conquer the basic latency issue is is very, very important. The way it works now, on a conference call, in some cases, you're connecting to a central server, and that server is broadcasting out to everybody. 
Yeah, that's a hub and spoke architecture, pretty much. There's a server in the center of everything. When you log into your Zoom call, for instance, everybody logs into that into that server, uh, and you're communicating with everybody through the server. So one person speaks, it goes to the server, which then broadcasts it to everybody else on the call, and then somebody else responds to whatever speaker one was saying. It goes back to the server. Uh, and then gets rebroadcast to everybody else. And there's there's interesting audio processing going on there. There's echo cancellation happening so that you don't hear yourself coming back. Uh, most of these systems also do active speaker selection and cancellation of everybody else, so only one person can speak at a time. You've probably experienced that on a Zoom call where a couple of people all start to speak at once, and uh, the, the system will decide who's got the who's got the stand, who's got the mic, and will mute everybody else out, which can be very frustrating. And to you learn to be a little bit more more polite. Well, Telejam got rid of the talking stick idea of teleconferencing. Using something like Telejam, where everybody can speak all at once, is more like sitting around a dining room table at Thanksgiving dinner with your family, and everybody's just chattering away. It can still be difficult to understand who's saying what to whom, but at least that, uh, that constraint that only one person can have the mic at a time goes away. And that's important when you're playing music with other people. So just having everyone be able to say anything at any time, that still doesn't help with the music, where the beats that synchronize the musicians have to be on time. Before we compare it just to the hub and spoke, we should say that the other systems like Jam Kazam and and, and, and Jack Trip and Jamulus... um, well, actually, the Jamulus is still just the hub and spoke, but Jam Kazam, as I understand it, um, uses uses a peer to peer. But every peer is connected is connected to every other peer. So A is connected to connected to B and C, and B is connected to A and C, and C is connected to A and B, <laughs> and every one of them, um, you know, has to manage the latencies between all of the other players. Um, and computationally, this puts a heavy load as you grow the size of the ensemble as well. Whereas with hub and spoke, all you have is one connection to the server and back the server does all the work it puts more load on the server when you have when you have more people playing so those are the two models uh, hub and spoke and, and peer-to-peer everyone to everyone that's the back-end technology there's also the front-end technology what does a musician need to get this to work Musicians just want to play, and all of these existing, you know, software solutions require some amount of setup, some amount of calibration, some amount of tweaking for every pair-to-pair uh, pairing of players, which was very, very frustrating to a lot of the people early on. I know I tried to use these systems. I tried to help other people use these systems, um, and I know there's a, there's a burden there. There's a, there's a learning curve in a startup. So I wanted to come up with something that would basically be pretty much hands-free plug-and-play for the musicians. And that's also built into Telejam, which is a web app. There's nothing to install. It doesn't require any special hardware or software. Uh, In order to squeeze the latency down with these other existing apps, they usually say you have to have a fast internet connection, you have to have a wired internet connection, you have to have wired headphones, you can't use Wi-Fi, you can't use Bluetooth. But when we moved to, you know, open-sourced kind of industry standard technologies like WebRTC and Web Audio and put it in a browser written in, you know, JavaScript, client side, no server, we realized that we could relax a lot of these constraints. And people were able to, and still are, are able to use this program basically with any laptop that runs the Chrome browser that has any kind of microphone and any kind of headphone on it. It runs on hotspots, it runs on Wi-Fi, it runs on Bluetooth. We're really trying to lower the barrier to make it possible for people to play together. The goal for Mark was to make it possible for people, no matter where they were on Earth, to play together on beat without latency. They decided to chain the musicians together serially. So what we came up with is just a simple daisy chain from A to B to C to D. And sound moves in one direction. And the first person basically sets the tune, plays piano, might be playing the drum track. Uh, that sound then goes over the web to the next person. The next person doesn't really have to know how long it took that sound to get there. You know, something like making a telephone call. It's in their ears. They hear it. They respond to it by playing along with it. In their computer, we can perform a two-channel mix. 
the incoming from player one with the accompaniment played in real time, in the moment, by player two. They are immediately mixed together. That's a zero latency mix. There is no lag between those two players. And then that mixed audio track gets sent to player three. And again, player three doesn't really have any sense of how long it took for the sound to get from player two to player three. They hear two folks singing, playing together. That person will play on top of that, will be immediately mixed in at zero latency with respect to what that person is hearing, gets shipped on to the next player and the next and the, le- and the next and the next. I call this, in the early days, I called it sigma streaming for the mathematicians in the audience. So it's sort of left-associated arithmetic. At every point, what you're hearing is A, parenthesis plus B, parenthesis plus C, parenthesis plus D. So it's, it's sigma streaming. You could also consider that a pyramidal scheme where you're building and building and building a mix one player at a time. So maybe we take a step back for someone who doesn't necessarily know the recording process as it exists today. Basically, performers perform individually to control the quality of sound for each. You go into a studio, someone lays down an initial beat or track, and then everybody builds on that. So, as a singer, maybe you're coming in last and the music is already laid down and you're listening to it in headphones while you sing. It's something a little bit like karaoke, okay? Imagine that you, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're having a party and uh, you want to, you know, sing some tune, but you don't have a, you know, you don't have a band to, to sing with. So you go online, you go to one of the karaoke sites, you pick your favorite tune, uh, and up it comes, and you press play, and your computer is spouting out what we would call a backing track. You know, oompa doom papa oompa pa doom papa and you you know step up if you're in a bar maybe or if you're at home and you've got a little microphone you step up and you're with your microphone you're just like singing along with my backing track and singing along now imagine somebody now imagine somebody has a tape recorder in the room and they're holding their mic above you and what that mic is picking up is both what you're singing and what the karaoke site is playing and that is an overdub you have something that was pre-recorded that's being performed, being played back. You got somebody, some live talent in the room that's singing, playing along with it. And then you've got another recording device that is recording both what was being played back at the same time that the new live person is syncing to it. And that's essentially what an overdub is. The karaoke approach is actually pretty legitimate for learning music. And for those of us who remember the good old Music Minus One records, which we used to practice to when we were kids, which was called MMO, you'd put the record on, it would play the Mozart clarinet concerto, and you could play along with the orchestra. This is exactly the opposite. It's OMM, one more musician. Every trip down the line, there's one more player in the mix, one more player in the mix, and it grows and grows and grows till it pops out at the end with a full ensemble, which can be live broadcast to an audience that's listening or it can be recorded and then played back to the ensemble to get the, to get the idea of what the, they all sounded like playing together. So Mark is just expanding on this basic idea. When you overdub, you have the choice of mixing the two together, which is what we do in Telejam, so that we don't increase the computing load when you go player to player to player to player. It's, still, it's just a stream of audio, and the first leap only has one player in it. The second leap has the mix of the two uh, non-fungibly mixed mixed together they're just they're they're there they're, they're mixed together and again and again and again whereas some of these systems like digital audio workstations would work in a multi-track sort of way so this is important mixing tracks together is different from multi-track mixing the two or more tracks are blended together and that makes it really hard in post-production to separate out and make specific edits to one and not the other Multi-track, on the other hand, are parallel tracks. If you want to make an edit later to one track, you can without affecting the other tracks. Uh, how would I talk about a multi a multi-track? You could think of them, um, well, obviously typewriters with red red black ribbons, but we don't have typewriters anymore. Uh, but if you uh, if you just consider, uh, well, let's say streams. Uh, you've got a stream running and water is flowing through that stream, and you've got a parallel stream running in another pipe. 
and sound is running through that too. But the two are synchronized. So instead of water running through those pipes, you could think of sound running through those pipes. And you're filling one with what's being played back, and you're filling the other one with what's being performed at the same time. So those two tracks or those two pipes are synchronized. Uh, and in the old days when we had tape, because the tape was only so wide, you could only fit so many uh, players individually on their separate tracks. In the old days, we had stereo two tracks for the left and right, and then we had the cartridges and the cassettes with the four tracks and the eight tracks. And the advantage of, of the multi-tracking is that every time you play the tracks back together, you can sweeten an audio-wise tinker with each of those tracks separately. Like, you've got a separate track for the drums, the bass, and the piano, and the drums are too loud. But if you didn't record them together, if you just recorded them on parallel tracks, you can turn that drum up or down and kind of balance it. Also, and this gets really nasty in the, in the digital age, you can edit those tracks by slicing out clinkers and bad notes and putting good notes in. And if it's the entire ensemble recorded together, it's really hard to say, oh, they really blew at the oboe player in measure 72, hit a, hit a lemon, and slice measure 72 out and try to find another take of the whole orchestra playing and slip it in. Nah. But if you're multi-tracking, and if you're lucky, you can just grab that one clinker for the oboe player at that spot, pull it out, find another take where they did it right, and put it in. This is something that astonished me when I started working in the recording industry with the Diaxis people. And I would go and visit some of the high-end recording studios like Sony in New York, where people were using this. This kind of like realized Glenn Gould's dream. Glenn Gould was a very, very famous pianist who gave up performing live because he was really entranced with recording. And he was fortunate that he was mostly a solo performer. And he was very, very compulsive about the quality of the, of, of the performances that he put to, put to tape and put to record. They're, the, they're very, very popular. Okay, I was lucky to be in film school when everything was transitioning over to digital. Rather, it already had, but I had a few diehard professors who insisted on teaching the old-school film and audio techniques that included, well, razor blades and scotch tape. Yet, frame by frame, beat by beat, all laid out on a Steinbeck editing table over a reel-to-reel -reel recorder. You have no idea how many minute edits I make to each episode of the Hacker Mind podcast. With digital, it's all cut and paste and cut and paste and cut and paste, as easy as, uh, as, as in a word, uh, word processor. In fact, that's how, the way I used to describe digital workstations in the early days when nobody knew what we were doing. I think it's a word processor for sound. Um, and it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of a, a wonderful thing that the world has turned into it's all cut and paste, with Negroponte saying bits are bits, but it's a terrible thing that the world's kind of, kind of cut and paste. Because now you can edit to your heart's content, and I would see these uh, classical editors for, for audio bragging about how many edits there were in the finished product. They are so clean that you can't hear them. Uh, and there's this, you know, this one idea that, you know, better is better, but there's the others that, no, live is better. <laughs> you know, this is life. Uh, and the two will, will, will never quite see eye to eye. And, you know, they're both reasonable given, uh, given what the context and what your, uh, what your goal is. But yeah, so the, the idea when you're multi-tracking to, uh, to be able to edit individually is very powerful. And Telejam gives you that option if that's where you want to go. And it was very, very easy to add that to the, uh, uh, to add, to add that to the program. And this is what I discovered is we, got, we were very, very happy with the original performance. We, the latency problem was solved almost immediately. It was like, what? Well, uh, this works. Problem solved, right? Latency has been conquered. But then when we discovered all the different ways people wanted to use it and all the different, you know, I wouldn't say complaints, but the, the, the pain points they had, when can we do this, when can we do this, okay, and we just started a little bit of feature creep. I don't think it's too much, because uh, when I look at what's, what's in there, it's a nice kind of summary of what my life's work has been. <laughs> and in another way, it's a very interesting summary. Because my, my home consultancy, I haven't done much consulting at home, but I used to call myself Stone Soup Studio. I still do. And you know the story of Stone Soup where the soldiers come into town and they're really, really hungry, but there's no food. So they, they put out a, a, a pot of boiling water and the people say, what are you doing? Oh, we're making stone soup. They drop a stone in it. But man, if I only had some carrots. Oh, I have carrots. And plop. So 
originally this came to my mind <laughs> when I started to get involved in uh, in computer and music software for myself rather than working for Karma or working for the DAW companies. And um, first, I, I I was doing some consulting for one of the companies at home. I couldn't work in their offices anymore because they had a sick building. I said, well, you know. I'd love to consult, but I need a computer. You know, I don't really own my own computer because well, I've never had to pay for one before. You know, <laughs> early days of PCs. We'll lend you a Mac. Oh, great, fine. Mac comes into the house. I'm doing work for them. It's like great. I got this now, but boy, it would be fun to play with the Max programming language, which I had been using at, at, at Karma. But you know, I don't really have the money to do this. And then one of my friends, you know, said, oh, I'll, "I'll give you a bootleg copy of Max, and here you go." Well, that's cool. Uh, but I really don't have a synth module to make the sounds that I need. I have an extra synth around, you know, and I don't have a loudspeaker to listen to. And, and gradually, over time, I built up this little home studio all from Stone Soup. It would be really nice, really nice, really nice. Um, and then over time, I realized what I needed, and I made a little bit more money, and so I started to buy out my own. So that, that, that was one genesis of Stone Soup. Everybody liked contributing what they contribute. There is a sense of opening up the world. You don't have to rely on the local musicians you have. Now you can bring in talent from around the world. If only I had a bass player. But now when I think of Telejam, it's like, well, we got this ensemble here together, and I'm playing piano, and we got the bass player, but oh, I really could use a good singer. I have a singer over there in, in Bangalore. Can we we'll, we'll, you know, bring her in? Sure, let's put the singer in there. And then somebody else wants, oh, this friend of mine plays drums, but he's over in Brooklyn. Yeah, come on, let's do it. Put the push in Brooklyn. And it's Stone Soup. It's Sigma Streaming, and it's Stone Soup, which makes me very happy. All is not perfect with this method. Mark alluded to that earlier that there was a downside to using the daisy chain. The trade-off here is that when you're working in a one-way daisy chain, you can only hear the people who played before you. You can't hear the people after you. And when you first explain this to some musicians, they'll kind of screw up their, their face and go, well, what do you mean I can't hear the people that come after me? I can hear the people that came before me, but that's, that's kind of weird. And the reply to that is, not really. We've been making music like this, and it's called overdubbing and recording sessions for decades and decades. And people who are familiar with how to do that can be comfortable with it. Some musicians may not be. Many, many are. Uh, this is not a new idea to, to overdub. What's new is to do it in real time. Mark's alluding once again to the way in which studio recordings are done. Recording each track is done over a period of time. In this case, we're doing all of this live. And that can be very, very pleasing if you're ready to take the musical hit that everyone can't hear everyone, but you certainly can hear everyone who came before you. And this is a big deal because when we hit the pandemic and everybody went to ground, we had choral directors, we had uh, orchestras all going, oh my gosh, we can't play together. We've got a service on Sunday. You know, we want to keep the orchestra members happy, keep our audience engaged. What are we going to do? And out came the Brady Bunch video. What Mark is talking about is Zoom, Google Meet, or any other type of teleconferencing software you use today has this idea of putting everybody in little boxes, and you can kind of look around at each other, even if you're thousands of miles apart. But here, sound and picture are not in sync. Not really. See, it's one thing to conquer latency with audio. It's entirely another to do so with video streaming. Ah, but you saw those performances during the pandemic, and everybody looked to be in sync. Well, chances are they were edited together later, after the fact. What Mark is trying to do is capture the spontaneity of a musical event. Nothing new about Brady a bunch videos where you see a matrix of faces and people are singing and playing together. None of that is done in real time, and so many people never understood that. I was amazed when this started to happen and proliferate on the web in the early days of the pandemic, and people would go, "Did you hear what the what, what the Berlin Philharmonic did? Or my my, uh, my my church choir is singing on Sunday services. They're all singing together. It sounds great." Or uh, I think there was a Rolling Stones special at one point, and they had the Stones people in. In their, in their living rooms, like playing together. I was like, no, no, this is not what's going on. It's a sound sculpture. It's an assembled mix, which is a wonderful thing, but it's all done out of real time. Somebody lays a track down, the track goes to somebody else, they play against that. This can be done in situ in a studio where you bring the talent in one person at a time. There are also web-based applications that allow you to do this online and fly it around. 
uh, where you know the, the evolving mix is in the cloud and the engineer can call people in and they, they play what they have to play and then they go home and then they record the next person. And it's all mixed together. This is all wonderful and this is what I call varieties of musical experience. Uh, it doesn't do much for the players, I think. Like my orchestra, the Redwood Symphony, started to do this early on, and we were given backing tracks and told to go home and play them on our cell phones and then send them in. And it's not so exciting, I think, for me as a musician to lay a track down against everybody else, especially when I knew I was experimenting with this uh, this technology that could let us do it together. And we're not just talking about the Rolling Stones performing together. We're also talking about the local church choirs. They, too, can benefit from this. How many... I know people are listening. How, how many choir directors I personally know that would send the emails out? I need your track by Thursday. Please give me your track so I can mix it together and uh, and uh, and assemble the, the songs that we have to play for Sunday service. This is happening again and again and again. This led me to add other features to Telejam that 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 to take advantage of some of my previous experience in in, in the music world. Oh yeah, we said earlier, Mark is quite accomplished in the digital music industry, digital audio workstations, or DAW. You know, besides being interested in, in sound qua sound and recording and, 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 and mixing and, and you know, just WebRTC technology and such, I was one of the people who participated in the digital audio workstation revolution. Uh, online, uh, not online, but uh, digital recording multi-track on, on computers, which, uh, you know, blossomed into programs like uh, Audacity and Pro Tools. But when uh, when SoundDroid blew up at, at Pixar, I called that the Big Bang of digital audio. And, and so many people that were involved, it wasn't Pixar, it was Lucasfilm at the, at the ranch. Uh, so many people that were involved in that project took off and started their own small companies. Uh, Andy Moore was one. Uh, who uh, developed developed the SoundDroid originally, uh, and he did um, Sonic Solutions, which was a very high end uh, digital audio workstation. Uh, a couple of other fellows put uh, together um, a high quality D to A converter, and then got a, a brilliant programmer named Adrian Freed to write a waveform editor for it called MacMix, and they formed a company called Integrated Media Systems, and I was employee number 10 with them, and we put out a system called Diaxis MacMix. It was one of the first commercially available popular digital audio workstations. Dark Side of the Moon was remastered with it. Uh, a lot of the Mahler stuff done with uh, San Francisco Symphony uh, still being recorded on a follow-on system that I designed with Sony uh, for the digital audio uh, one-bit DSD super audio CDs. Um, so I was involved in the recording end of the of the of the industry early on, and I learned that there's many many different ways to record. There's recording for broadcast, for video, for radio, for post-production, for, for, for audio, for CDs. I had already been a recording performer in my days in Baltimore. I was staff percussionist at uh, uh, pub, Maryland Public Radio. And for many, many years when Wall Street Week came on nationwide, the first thing you heard was my xylophone going, dink. <laughs> and we did many, many overdubbing sessions there, uh, uh, one a month. So very familiar with what recording's like. So... When I realized we already had this capability with Telejam to play down the line, and obviously I wanted to make recordings at the end anyway to archive and, and, and uh, verify what we were doing, and also in the debugging process to, to try to squeeze the latency out, make sure we weren't fooling ourselves that, that, right. uh, that we were, were, were synchronizing, uh, we built basic recording capability uh, into Telejam at the end. So... The first reason for doing this, obviously, is you've got a one-way daisy chain, and everybody's playing, but you only hear the person to your left. Well, we just did a wonderful take of Fly Me to the Moon. I wondered what that singer did in Measure 17 when I slipped that special little chord. It's like the tail wagging the dog here when you're in the beginning. You can't hear what's happening down the line. This may be subtle to a non-musician, but hearing a slight change in live music can either throw off a mediocre musician or inspire a great musician. With one-way daisy chains, you don't necessarily know until later how that change was interpreted. So it's very satisfying, and as soon as we finish the take, and I use the word take as if we're in a recording session, boom, I can then take what we just recorded and play it back to the group, and we can all hear it. So there's this very, very fast communal instant feedback. But again, if we're in daisy chain mode, 
You know, we can't talk about it. So in the early days, what I was doing was turning off the daisy chain, turning on to Zoom, going back to Zoom, playing the recording into Zoom. And then I thought, well, there's no reason the daisy chain has to run in one direction. The reason for one running in one direction is, is to synchronize. But we can ship audio in two directions on a peer-to-peer connection. It just won't be time synchronized. But who cares if we're talking to each other? You know, there'll be longer and longer gaps if we're as far away as Bangalore to, uh, to America. You get used to it. Some people do. Some people don't. Um, so I, we built in the, the two-way daisy chain in what we call talk mode for conversational work. We had the one way for recording, and then we could bloop, play that recording back. Made, just made everything just a lot more fun, effective, faster. Then I realized, well, if we're recording the, the mix at the end... Why not record the individual contribution as a track at every player's position? No reason not to do it. It's just a recording. And because we're shipping compressed audio peer-to-peer, you know, for efficiency's sake, and it's very, very good. It's Opus Encoders on web, uh, on web, RD, uh, web RTC, and they sound damn good. You know, it's, you know, MP3 quality sound, which is, quote unquote, good enough for a lot of people, especially if the object is to have fun and play together, uh, not produce Deutsche Grammophon level audiophile recordings. However, what's going on in each person's computer is a in loco uh, right there recording, which is a WAV file, you know, compressionless, full, full more audio, whatever the computer can do. And it's, it's what each player plays. And so now we've got a mix coming out the end, which is very rapidly produced and, and effective. But we've also got the individual tracks or stems recorded at each place, which then can be uploaded to the cloud, downloaded back to a producer's location, remixed in any digital audio workstation of their choice. So we now have this hybrid mode of working. It's got the free zone and the immediacy of a live conference call or live session, but it also has the capability to track and remix and re-record and post-produce like you would do with a, with a DAW, which is very, very powerful. So now a choir director can say, I'll see you all at six o'clock on Telejam, and the piano player can start playing and everybody can sing their part. Everything can be recorded. You can listen to the mix and say, ah, I didn't quite like what you guys did in letter B. Let's, let's do another take. Bloop, you do another take. Thank you all very much. I've got all your tracks. See you in church on Sunday online. And now the producer's got all the tracks they want. They can either use the, the already mixed you know, rough cut, if it's good enough, or they can start slicing and dicing and editing and do all the magic that we've been doing with digital audio workstations again, again for decades. So my point here is that We've got a hybrid system that takes advantage of a lot of the existing technology, existing working styles, and amps it up by adding this ability to play synchronized and everybody together. Quiet nights of quiet stars, quiet chords from my guitar, floating on the silence. So we started talking out about latency. Here's an example of a flautist in L.A., a bass and voice in separate homes in Baltimore, and a percussionist in San Francisco. But we still haven't resolved the issue of what it's like from here to Bangalore. That's a certain distance, and that takes a certain amount of time, whether that be nanoseconds or full-on seconds. You're in a daisy chain. This seems to me like you still have some latency to deal with. You're just pushing it out. Right. The problem is you don't, you don't experience the latency. It's, it's all relativistic, actually. <laughs> uh, during the pandemic, I started reading all about the new physics and things and wrapping my head around time travel and the speed of light and such. And if you've got the God view and you're standing outside everything, you can look down and you can see that Mark in San Francisco just boop de boop de boop but the guy over in Bangalore hasn't heard it yet. And some milliseconds later, it's usually sub-second, but it's lots of milliseconds later, all of a sudden, the guy in Bangalore hears boop de boop de boop but I'm already going ka-chunga, ka-chunga, but he doesn't hear that. But so the point is, from his point of view, there is no latency. Again, if I make a phone call to Paris, and I go, hello, 
The person in Paris just hears, hello. They don't know when I said it versus when they heard it. But from my point of view, in a full duplex two-way conversation, I go, hello, how are you? And I'm waiting, waiting. It goes over to Paris. They say, hello, how are you? And they go, right, I'm the tout va bien. And it comes back, waiting, boom, boom. And then I get it. So latency is a tricky thing. People go, oh, latency, look at the number. Okay, there's a number, but who's hearing it? If you're not hearing it, is it if the tree falls in the forest, is it really there? <laughs> and in fact, the original meaning of the term latency is hidden. It was when symptoms for a, uh, for a disease would not appear until after the disease had already taken over. There was this latent period before you even knew you had it. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, what we are doing to latency is hiding it. You know, you're not really ignoring it. We're just hiding it. It's not there. It's as good as just not there. It's magic. So I'm wondering if there are any other uses for the daisy chain model to resolve latency problems. Well, I can say that one of the things that people do miss by working only in the audio uh, domain is visual. And originally I thought, well, you know, we can probably just do exactly the same thing uh, with the video as well. Stream the video person to person to person to person. But again, here's this thing about cut, copy, paste, which works and doesn't work. Negroponte, Nicholas Negroponte, the founder of the MIT Media Lab, was famous for saying bits are bits, which got me really mad when I read that in one of his early books. Because they're not, all bits are not created equal. You can drop one audio bit from a very quiet passage in, in, in high quality music. And if you're in an ideal listening environment, you will hear the tick. An audio bit is a very is a, is a larger part of the total data stream, really, of the audio stream. You drop one bit in a video, one pixel in a video, no one's going to see that, you know. And so, if you're cutting, copying, and pasting bits, bits are not always bits. Bits, what they represent, means means something. And this is why the day it's it's a different set of problems. Um, to synchronize, uh, well, not to synchronize, but to, yeah, it is, to synchronize the video and the audio on a stream. Uh, and programs like you, you Zoom today have that problem because there's an audio stream that they have to process. There's a video stream that they have to process. And I don't think anybody is convinced when you watch closely a Zoom production that the lips and the sound, what you're seeing and what you're hearing are actually uh, in sync. Uh, that's a problem. And there's all kinds of tricks to, to make it better and better, and Zoom is getting, you know, Zoom and the, and the rest of the field are getting better and better at that. So how would that apply to Telejam? Same problem. Um, and probably with even harder constraints, because the reason the musicians want to see the video is because they want to see the conductor. They want to somehow see what the leader is doing, um, even if the leader is not playing anything. Okay. That's a hard problem. And I've started to think a little bit more about it. Originally, I thought we could, well, we'll just do a Brady Bunch thing because you can't, you can't mix video like you can mix sound. You know, if I just slop your picture on top of my picture, on top of the horn player's picture, you're not going to see anything. So what happens? You need a matrix. You need a Brady Bunch. You need what Zoom does. Okay, so you have a black matrix maybe and you know you've got six players and you've got three by two and the first player goes into his little corner and then it gets streamed with the, with the audio well, and then... Okay, you've got the second player playing their audio. Their audio gets mixed, and that's not a problem. What are you going to do with their video? Okay, we'll, we'll put it into their, into their special little uh, square as well. But it ain't that simple, because the processing that's going on in, in the machine at that node is separate forks probably for the video processing and the audio processing. How do you wed them back together again so they're still in sync with each other? You know, so it's kind of like a meta synchronization problem now. I think it can be solved. I'm not sure it can be solved uh, in a web app, you know, which has you know constraints on processing power and memory usage. It might require a native app with a large amount of space for buffering video. Mm. And one of the other wonderful things about uh, Telejam is that there is no time code represented in the stream. Since all we're doing is taking a stream of audio, doing a real-time overdub, you don't need any time code. All these other 
many of the other uh, systems are time stamping and sending time code and having synchronization and extra buffering and and uh, we don't we don't have to do that but if you're going to do that with video you know which is coming at a different rate different processing um, it sounds like something like a time stamped system might be the better way to go and it's not going to be as simple as a, as a telejam daisy chain well telejam is an audio only application it can run alongside video streaming or conferencing apps to provide a simultaneous video feed. This will not be in sync with the audio, of course. Players performing should really not look at that video, but use it to see and be seen by each other and a wider audience that's watching the video app. The Telejam output can be patched into the video app to send a synchronized audio signal to the audience. Well, you know, we have Zoom channel on and people can see each other, but it's a really bad thing to watch. It'll be way out of sync, even more than Zoom would be if everybody's playing together, right. uh, even even muted. So, and that's that's kind of a sad thing um, on the Telejam site. It's it's kind of fun. Uh, we have mostly uh, it's Telejam.net. We have uh, a few audio files of uh, people around the world playing together, and we have one where a video was taken without my knowledge by one of the participants, uh, who's the accordion player, uh, also an amazing uh, machine learning maven. Uh, has his machine algorithms writing Sven Polsky, polka music, da, 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 da. and we recorded some of the stuff that uh, his ML wrote for us with him playing accordion and, and another uh, music information retrieval expert, uh, Cynthia Lem in Delft, playing melodica, and I'm sitting in California just clapping along because I wanted to make sure you know everything was right on the money. And unbeknownst to me, Bobby was doing a, sc a screen capture of this uh, and then he, he posted it, and I was looking at it, going like, "Well, yeah, we're really playing together." And wow, it, 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 I, I know, I, I know, we're playing together. I could hear it, and I'm looking at the video, and that's impossible. If he took a screen snap of his video, we we were not playing together. Those videos have to be coming in at a different time. But what he had done was he had post produced the video and resynced the audio so that it was synced. There were three images there. Accordion, melodica, me. And I had a very visible clap going on. So he synchronized the clap with my hand clapping. So when you looked at the video, you'd hear it clap and you'd see my hands move. And it's like, yep, I'm in sync. And then you're watching the other players just blowing their instruments and fingering. And I'm like, well, the trick is you can't tell what they're playing by, by looking at what they're playing right now. But I, I zeroed in on it because I know the piece and I started to watch the fingers. And I went, uh huh. Nope. Yeah. Those videos are not video in sync, but the hand clapping is in sync, and right. that's, that's the trick. And uh, I, I actually did a trick on the trick. I had two sisters. One was in Zurich, and one was in North Carolina who wanted to sing uh, Because I Knew You from Fro uh, Frozen or from Wicked? From Wicked. Because I Knew You as a birthday present to their mother. And I hooked them up with a backing track that I played for them to hold them together, and they sang together. Uh, and at the same time, I, I had them on, on YouTube, uh, not on YouTube, on Zoom, and I, don't, don't look at it, don't look at it, it's going to confuse you, just listen to, the, listen to your pianist. But I made a recording of it, and you can see them sitting there waiting for their cues and, and, and singing, and, and only, I could cue one up to the sound, but then the other one wouldn't be cued. So I went and I excised the two singers into two separate videos, you know, threw them into iMovie, synced the two singers up with the actual track, made another iMovie of that, and off it went to mom as a birthday present, and it, it works. So, but that's like a Brady Bunch solution. That's an after-the-fact solution. Um, you could imagine, however, doing like an OBS OBS is uh, online broadcasting system, open source software that a, that a lot of people in streaming uh, use nowadays, which does enable you to grab pieces of the screen and set delays on them in real time. So you could imagine some sort of super OBS setup where you've got Telejam running, you've got some video app running, be it uh, you know Zoom or, or, or Meet or Jitsi or all kinds of other things that are out there, and then have OBS running to... To, to snarf the particular players on the screen, apply a different delay to each one to synchronize them, and then ship that in with the, with the music. So there's, there's opportunity for that, which would be a really a super system. Uh, but there's a lot of work involved. There's still a lot of labor there. So throughout this journey, is there something that really surprised Mark? 
One, one thing that's surprising to me is that you know, we've conquered the latency, but we, we haven't conquered time. So if I want to play with my friend in Bangalore, which is like 13 and a half hours away, we have to find a time when we're both awake, <laughs> uh, which is challenging, but we, we, we've, we've managed. The other thing is I'm still curious about scaling. When we first began, like how many players can we mix together before we saturate the audio mix? And we were happy to discover... Um, some research work that uh, just doing the math on mixing it, that if we could control the levels of each participant, um, keeping them down around minus 12, minus 18 dB, that successive addition of new tracks does is, is not going to peg uh, the audio for quite some time. And, and indeed, when we 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 carefully you know manage the uh, the audio levels of each player, um, we haven't had a problem yet of saturation with players. Uh, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link, so it's still the internet. <laughs> so you have to make sure at least you, you've got a, a, a peer-to-peer link for every player that's going to hold, because if one link in the chain breaks, the chain is the chain is gone. You have to restart it. We that happens occasionally, but not that often. Right. But it does happen. It's a risk you take. Uh, the largest ensemble I've used so far has been about seven players. It's a Peabody Ragtime Ensemble coming from their homes. Very raucous stuff, playing playing ragtime music, and that seems to work. I would love to work with a string quartet, a wind quintet. Uh, the issue of playing jazz. Uh, has, where you're improvising and there's no there's no score is enabling because people can just play given what they're given. On the other hand, because it's not an all way listening event, you can't really have the entire ensemble reacting to each other. But if you put the players in the correct order, it's fine mm-hmm. if the players are, are amenable uh, amenable to that. Written music is is harder where you, you really need a conductor. One of the things we can do is to put a click track in, which we really don't like to do. But again, one of the tricks we can do with Telejam, basically with anything that has recording capability or multi-tracking capability, is I can have a stereo signal going, I do have a stereo signal going down the daisy chain. And uh, the left channel is the actual performance, but the right channel is what I can call the ghost track. And it can be as simple as a metronome, it can be uh, like a karaoke backing track like I did for the Singing Sisters where uh, I, I took the piano and sent that down the separate track. It could be a rehearsal pianist for a choir where the conductor is conducting the pianist, the pianist is playing, everybody in the choir drops in and drops out, but the piano is running it all down. When you pops out at the end, you can mute the ghost track and all of a sudden you've got an a cappella performance mm-hmm. or you've got the performance without the ticking metronome. Mm-hmm. So... You can hold. There are ways to hold an ensemble together that don't interrupt or cor- or corrupt the listening experience, depending on what you want to do. And there's more more work to be done with that. I'd really like to thank Mark Goldstein for sharing his work to make live music performances possible, no matter where the artist is physically located. Think of it: all the great musicians might one day be able to perform together as one in real time, without them ever leaving their homes. I have so many stories about hackers who are making a positive difference in the world. I don't want you to miss out. And be sure to check out Error Code, my new podcast that focuses on IoT and embedded security. Error Code is available now wherever you get your podcasts. Let's keep this conversation going. DM me at Robert Vimosi on Twitter or join me on Discord. You can find the deets at hackermine.com. For The Hacker Mine, I'm Robert Vimosi.